the late 18th century, Philadelphia was the epicenter of a newly formed nation. South 2nd Street was akin to the Champs-Élysées in France. Matter of fact, the French played a major role in developing this part of town. With thousands fleeing a country in turmoil, French confectioners and bakers alike found a home in this very neighborhood and introduced new culinary experiences that Philadelphians had never seen before. We'll join the Burley brothers of Shane Confectory and Franklin Fountain in Philadelphia who are continuing the old world tradition that began hundreds of years ago. We also learn about the beginning of ice cream molds in America and heat up some of Thomas Jefferson's favorite chocolate drink. Let's go back to a time when America spoke French and experienced a taste of history. In the late 18th century, the French Revolution was gaining violent momentum, causing many French to flee from their ungovernable homeland. In 1793, the same year that saw the execution of the French monarchy, a large influx of French immigrants sought refuge in the newly formed United States. Philadelphia was the epicenter of the colonies. I mean, this was as close as the United States ever had to a great metropolis. These French refugees, which included many former aristocrats, quickly assimilated into Philadelphia and exposed the American people to their refined European culture. Walking along 2nd Street, one would have heard French spoken in the streets. You could take French lessons from these formerly really wealthy figures, elite, sophisticated figures, who had no means of livelihood anymore, and so we're now teaching French to Philadelphia's elite. While there were many services offered by the French in Philadelphia, it was their delightful cuisine that took Second Street by storm. French food being cooked, French pastries being prepared, French bread. So there were all these new culinary experiences that one could have in Philadelphia for the first time. And among the delicacies that were most appreciated by Philadelphians at this time was French ice cream, which surprised and delighted Americans in Philadelphia. I'd like to tell you, our viewers, about two brothers that I felt an immediate kinship the Burley Brothers. Right down the street from the city tower, Eric and Ryan Burley are making their own history with Shane Confectionery and Franklin Fountain. Shane Confectionery is known for the classic candies of yesterday. Glass cases filled with decadent chocolates. The old-fashioned chewy caramels, buttercreams. The sparkling clear toys. We were inspired by the European model, and that's the experience we wanted to bring to Market Street. Ice cream has always been a part of American life, but in the 18th century, it was considered a luxury. Decorative ice cream centerpieces formed with intricate molds were signs of class and wealthiness. Today, I get to see this age-old process. But first, let's meet up with Eric and make some ice cream from scratch. Walter, welcome to Shane Confectionery's kitchen. Today we're going to make, for the first time ever, Thomas Jefferson's French vanilla style ice cream with our caramelized banana base. So history is going to be made here today. And you'll be the first one to try it. So we're going to start with the milk and the heavy cream and some half and half. And the better the cream, the better the ice cream. And then we're going to add the sugar and also some uh, palm sugar. There's a vanilla bean. It's also called black gold. We also use vanilla extract. Jefferson talked about vanilla extract from Mexico. So we have Mexican extract today. But first we're gonna put on to the second candy stove our bananas and we're gonna caramelize them up some sugar and some butter and of course some Jamaican rum. Chopping them up. We're gonna first use some brown sugar to bring out the molasses. We're gonna cook them on the kettle. There is no substitute in using copper kettles. Even the flavors right now, I, I have a very sensitive nose and it just smells so delicious already. So once the cream is boiling, bananas and the sugars caramelizing together, so we're gonna add a little bit of Jamaican rum. It's gotta be simmered down a little bit. So we're gonna take the nutmeg and just a little pinch of nutmeg 
You're going to grate that right into the cream? I cook with nutmeg most all the time because all the recipes from the 18th century utilizes nutmeg. Yeah, absolutely. And then finally we're going to add just a little pinch of salt. This is Cape May sea salt and it's just full of flavor. It's as close to the Atlantic Ocean as we can get. The French style ice cream, you think of it as more yellow and it's just using the egg yolk. Egg yolk yeah. Take the six egg yolks, and we're just gonna whisk this. We're mixing hot in with egg yolks, and we don't wanna make scrambled eggs, so we're gonna add a little bit of the cream mixture in, just so it sort of gets used to the temperature. This is to safeguard if you wanna make it at home. Perfect. Voila. You can just add that slowly. Now you get the color. And we're working here with bananas, so the end result will be a, a yellowish ice cream no matter what, which is kind of perfect. So chef, the next step is to pour the cream base into the banana base. And everything can go right in. Because when it's hot, really the flavors you want them to infuse. Now we're gonna strain the whole mixture. And I can just press the bananas through the sieve. Perfect. That's good. And we're gonna use some more of that ice later. So you're gonna take your flavored cream base and cool that down. While we're waiting for the cream mixture to cool, we're gonna prepare our ice bucket just with simple chipped ice and salt in the old method. We're gonna actually just pour our cream mixture right in. Wow, <laughs> that's good. All those spices are great to keep right into the ice cream. Mm -hmm. We're gonna close the sorbets here, and in the old method, they would just roll it around, and you can keep adding ice, water, and salt. So as you can see, chef, it's a lot of work just to make a little bit of ice cream. I mean, not done yet. And we're not done. We're gonna send you over to Ryan and you're gonna see how the ice cream is then molded oh, and presented. In the 18th century. That's right. Great. So one of the things, uh, Walter, that we were so inspired to start this business was the artistry of how ice cream had been served in the old days. These molds, well, they were originally made in Philadelphia, many of them. Some are French and German but they were made in the 19th century. They molded ice cream into fancy shapes, evocative of the natural world around them. The only difference between us and them is that we have the luxury of dry ice to show the audience as well, you know? This is difficult work as it is, but in the old days, I can't imagine they must have been pulling their hair out. Uh, that's why I don't have any more. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things about molding ice cream is that you want the mold super cold if you keep the, the ice cream a little more on the liquid side, it's easier to make the mold. Right? That's right. So when it hits the mold, it forms an even skin. It kind of congeals right away. Yes, yes, right away. If it's completely firm, you have a hard time with a spatula putting it in. At this stage, it's much easier to fill the form. It's ironic because this ice cream that we're serving here started out on the hot stove. Yep. And here we are at the coldest extreme. Oh, there you go. Okay. And then we're just going to bed it into the ice. It won't take long at all. Anyway. Yeah, less than five minutes. Now we can keep going and uh, fill the rest of the mold. So what you brought along? You brought some pineapple along, how appropriate? Yeah. You brought some strawberries? Yeah, so this is a strawberry sorbet. And we can just neatly bed that in there. Look at that, it can chills right away. Yep, you can see it. It turns a different color, actually. Perfect. So I'm ready, Ryan, to try this banana mold. It looks like it's been ready to go. So I show me how you. Ready. This is just regular room temperature water, very quickly. You gently use the oyster shucker, find a few pry points, and pry up. Now, if you let it sit in the ice too long, the piece will shatter. But you can try it. It's going to be awfully cold. That's the ice can be made earlier. What a great flavor. Amazing. Jefferson's recipe, 
banana or plantains, rum. I can taste the vanilla. I can even taste the nutmeg. Now we need to make a candied peel for it. Yeah. <laughs> Try one of these strawberries. Goes in. So then uh, the ice cream at the edge is kind of brittle. So we're going to shave that off. Now the thing about strawberries is, of course, they have a little green top. And we're just going to kind of paint it on there. Now it's, it's freezing immediately, which is, is kind of amazing. You're an artist. So Ryan, this stuff is all great, the banana, the strawberries, but I want to see the piece de resistance, the centerpiece, your unbelievable lobster you have in there. Now oh. this mold, you told me, I mean, we don't know exactly, but it's definitely been around for a few centuries. Well over 100, 150 years, I would say. Instead of being cooked, we have deep frozen this lobster. The thicker molds, you really need to let them set up a bit longer. I want to find the seam. Pretty good. Yep. This is a especially intricate mold. It's four piece and there's a lot of undercuts. So I'm going to warm up a towel to get it to release cleaner on the other pieces. You remind me of a surgeon here. Look at, Look at how the, the legs are. Yeah, the back's coming up, I see that. That's going to be easier for you. Oh. Perfect. All right. Gosh, look at that. Wow. So integrated. Look at the details on this guy. You can see why it was so special in the day. And I'm looking forward to eating him later. Yep, we'll dress him up, fix him up, and yeah. serve him to you on a platter. Welcome to the chocolate floor of Shane Confectionery. Kitty, it's so good to meet you. You know, I've been waiting all day because the aroma of the chocolate is driving me crazy because of all the chocolates you make for downstairs. Tell me a little bit what you've got here. Sure, this is some of our shell molded pieces, our bonbons. We have here our Liberty Bell bonbon, which is filled with our bean to bar chocolate. But you have so much variety down in the store, it's amazing. So how do you keep up? While we do mold a lot of pieces, we actually hand dip a majority as well. Would you like to give it a try? I hope I passed the test. We'll see. These are some of our buttercreams, actually, before they're dipped. Oh, and so what do you um, do? I put them on the sink? No, you actually... I throw them in there. Throw them in. Uh-huh. And fish them out. Mm-hmm. Uh, the only way I will make this deal with you is that I get to eat all the mistakes. That's perfectly fine. So then what you do is you take it, shake down the uh, excess. Am I doing all right? Mm-hmm. A little squirrely on top here. A little that. Good. I guess you don't have to eat those. It's what you think. <laughs> here we go. Mmm. Everything you guys do has so much love. I can just feel it. Love is in the air. Is. I'll be in the chocolate room. <laughs> <laughs> so here we are. Welcome to the Franklin Fountain, Chef. Absolutely spectacular. This is ice cream. I mean, it's just amazing what can be done. But, you know, the beauty, it's not new. That's been around for centuries. There's so much in the past that we can look to for inspiration. So Ryan, I want to thank you for a spectacular job and, thank show, and thank showing you, me things Walter. that I have not seen either. And thank you know, you. it wasn't the only thing that was molded in the 18th century. Absolutely. Not just ice cream, but clear toy candy. And do I have a treat for you, Pavia? Hi. Who is the, what you call it? Clear toy confectioner. You know, this is very close to my heart. I'm from Germany. Mm -hmm. And I grew up with exactly those figurines, Easter and Christmas time. And a lot of people today would tell you sugar is not good for kids. I did all right, no? <laughs> <laughs> so why don't you take me through the, the process? Okay, sure. So I mix together corn syrup and water. Mm -hmm. So this is nine cups of sugar mm -hmm. to three water and three corn syrup. So you want to moisten all the sugar crystals 
because if you have any dry ones once it's cooking, the candy will recrystallize after it's hardened and it can become foggy. After it reaches about 250, 260, then we'll put the food coloring mm -hmm. in it. And the yellow that you see here actually mm -hmm. has no dye in it. This is a, a natural this color a natural for the cooked sugar. Oh, yeah, okay. as is this one. This is just more cooked. Uh -huh. So I brought the pot over and I put it on the gas stove and it's gonna cook for about 35 to 45 minutes until it reaches 310 degrees. And I'm gonna put the thermometer in it so that we know when it's done. I'm brushing olive oil onto the mold so that the candy doesn't stick when it hardens. And then I fit the pieces together and rubber band it. Keep a steady stream. Oh, you're pretty good. So I switched to the smaller pot because it gives me more precision when doing the molds of the tinier holes. Sometimes if you try and use the big pot, you get a thicker stream and it'll clog up the passageways. We're gonna wait here for eh, like a couple minutes. Before we take them out, we chip off all this excess. So I kind of give it a few chops and clear out the passageways. This way it doesn't hold onto the mold. And then a lot of them have these little notches that I fit in like a key mm -hmm. and I open it up. Oh, look at that, it's a nice little cat. And then when we take them out of the molds, there's still sort of like a, a flange around the edge of it. And we take a paring knife and a little bit of a blowtorch sometimes so to clean up the edges. To the ice cream molds. This molds small baskets, it's one of my favorites. Hmm, so cute. Find any little notch you can, like that's like a nice here. one, and stick it in there and turn it like a key. Yep. Okay, got like a key. Oh no, her <laughs> legs didn't come out that time. What happened? Sometimes a little bit of sugar will get in the way of the passage. And oh, look at that. <laughs> she broke. And was, what's this guy? And this Even. is a ship. Beautiful. Yeah. You're trying to tell me to get on the ship and get out of here. <laughs> Really want to sing. Oh, uh, uh, thank you. To me, this was really a spectacular moment because it's so close to home. <laughs> and you did a spectacular job. I mean, you have to sit down to a science, and it's so beautiful. In 1793, a large influx of French immigrants sought refuge in the newly formed United States. With the arrival of these thousands of French people coming over, when they found themselves in Philadelphia, they found themselves in actually familiar surroundings. Second Street might have almost been a Parisian street at the time. Part of the ways that they forged this community was through French food. Located on Second Street, my restaurant, the City Tavern, was right in the midst of the French influx. Let's go to my bake shop and prepare a classic French baguette called then a pain long. Diana. Chef. Good to see you. You know, I had so much ice cream and chocolate. I'm ready for something serious. Oh, good. And I hear you're going to make a little uh, baguette for me. That's right. That should do the trick. What I have here is the mother. So this is the beginning of every good sourdough. Um, and it's just equal parts flour and water. So this is going to help create our sponge, which is just the flour, a little bit of extra yeast, mother, and water. Okay, so it starts with one and a half cups of warm water. Don't want too hot, otherwise you'll kill the yeast, and too cold and it won't activate the yeast. Okay. So next is yeast. Just gonna sprinkle that over. You just wanna get it so that there's not big clumps, so that all the yeast can bloom in there. Now I'll go ahead and add the mother in. Mm -hmm. There she goes. Diana, you realize that in 1793, Right here on 2nd Street, you could get already French bread. That's amazing. I would love to have tried some of that. Sometimes I think the entire revolution of France were founded over getting good bread. Hey, it's, it's <laughs> worth it. Yeah. Okay, so now just one and a half cups of all-purpose flour. And the better the flour, the better later the French bread. That the is flavor. true. There's very few recipes where you'll see all-purpose flour for a bread, but in this instance, it just works very well. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this will just let sit for 12 hours or overnight. This is what it will look like. 12 hours later. 12 hours later, it's good and bubbly. Lovely. That's exactly what you want. And it should smell. Oh yeah, it does. Yes. <laughs> Very, it's intoxicating, it really. Is, it really is. 
we will add two tablespoons of granulated sugar and two teaspoons of salt. How much flour goes? So this is five cups of flour. Now you may not need all of this. Depending um, on the... Exactly, depending on your humidity and what the weather is like. So I'm gonna start with just about half and then we'll save any extra for kneading. So, so as you can see, it's kind of stringy and mm -hmm. it's hard to move with the spatula here. So we'll just go ahead and dump it right out. And you just move it around, keep it moving, and you'll feel it start to change as it, as it goes along. Okay, so now just push it into a little ball. Grab our uh, lightly oiled bowl here. Yeah, and how long are you going to keep that now? Again, we'll just cover this with another towel. You could also use plastic wrap yeah. again. Perfect. Put it Good somewhere good. warm yeah. until it's double in size. So here we are. It's been about 45 minutes and our, as you can see, bowl is completely full of dough. All you want to do is deflate the dough. It's the most fun part. And here it goes. Woof. There we go. There it goes right onto our floured surface. Should come out nice and easy because of the oil that we put in there. So this part, you do wanna to try to keep it in more of a rectangular shape. Handy knife here. One. One, two, three. One, two, three. Exactly. It's pretty good to me. Yep. In order to get a tight seal, you really wanna keep it as flat as possible. So I'm folding it in and now, Starting with our corners on the outside, I'm gonna move them in together in the center, kind of into a triangle here. And this is going to help give you that tapered shape. And then I'm just pulling it in and just push until you meet the edge. And I'm just going to hit it just with the heel, all the way across. Close it up. Close it up, good. And this is where you wanna taper the ends as well. It's not very important, but it's that classic baguette shape. It's a story that I really like. When the metro was built, the subway underneath mm -hmm. Paris, uh, everybody would have a knife because, you know, they had a big pool of rope to cut it. And they wanted to outlaw the knives. So ah. for them to outlaw the knives, they had to give the French people their bread made of wine, obviously. Right. So, so by making it into a perlon, a long bread, mm -hmm. it's easy just to break a piece off. You don't need a knife. Perfect. We've got all three of our loaves here. We're going to dust them with a little bit more flour, again, so that the top half does not stick. And we're gonna set this in a warm place for 20 minutes or so. Keep an eye on them, make sure they're not exploding all over the place. You want them to be spongy to the touch and spring back slowly. Make sure it's nice and straight and use your paring knife and just score it. Okay, open that up. Roaring hot in there, so I'm just gonna very quickly toss it in. If you're baking in a home oven, you can use just a sheet pan also and I would go as hot as your oven can go. So here we have it, our baguette, fresh out of the oven, still hot. Can't wait to try it. And obviously, in the manner of France, a little butter on here. It's so great because right. simple, fantastic. Vive la France. Originating in ancient Mesoamerica, the tradition of grinding chocolate from the cacao bean eventually found its way to Europe to be enjoyed by the empires of the time. But for much of its history, chocolate was a beverage, not a bonbon. This savory drink followed European cultures as they established colonies around the world. French noble Marie Antoinette championed drinking chocolate, and Thomas Jefferson even believed it would surpass the popularity of coffee and tea. Today, the staff at Shane's Confectionery continue this timeless tradition in their drinking chocolate cafe. It's obviously a very labor-intensive process. You're grinding here for a while. And if you really go to town on this, you, you end up with sort of a coarse paste. This is really perfect for making a drink. You can steep it in hot water, just like you would a coffee or a tea. You can add milk. Possibilities are pretty wide. Mmm. You know, it amazes me that drinking chocolate was really the hottest thing in the 18th century, you know, as you know and I know. That's right, they serve drinking chocolates just like this. I want to thank you, your team, to A Taste of History. <laughs>